You're all very welcome to the first seminar of the Irish Studies Seminar Series uh, for 2021-2022. Uh, we've come off of the back of another extraordinary year uh, at NUI Galway and in Irish Studies in the Moore Institute as well. So we're very happy to have you back uh, with us this year um, for a very exciting range and wide ranging uh, series of talks, seminars, roundtable discussions um, on everything and anything to do with Irish culture um, and Irish society as well. Um, so we're delighted to have firstly um, with us uh, Dr. Zan Kamak, um, and she's going to be talking about uh, her most recent research, which is uh, Seeing Wild Songs, Oscar Wilde's Poetry and Charles T. Griff's Four Impressions. Um, and this really examines, I suppose, kind of a conversation that she's been exploring and opening up uh, research in the area of uh, the work of Charles Griffiths and his connection to Oscar Wilde's oeuvre as well. Uh, he was, uh, Griffiths was America's first impressionistic composer who was deeply inspired by Oscar Wilde's poetry in particular. The composer drew, drew out the latent musicality and highlighted the colour-based thematic developments in Wilde's works by interlacing written images with tonal references. His own synesthesia or colour hearing plays a particular role in drawing out the yellow gold tonalities and images in his wild songs. So it seems quite apt, I think, in many ways for the autumnal colours we have in Galway at the moment. Um, and the seminar will also outline the ongoing digital humanities project associated with the project uh, that delineates the intertextuality of Griff's four impressions uh, today. We're so delighted to have Zan back because she's no stranger to these, to these shores. Um, she's um, at the moment a lecturer in the Department of English and Literature at Utah Valley University in the US. Uh, she was the Fulbright Scholar at the School of Irish Studies at Concordia University in Montreal in 2017 and 2018. Um, but prior to that, uh, she was with us as a graduate of the MA in Irish Studies programme in Galway. Um, so we're very proud of her work uh, to date and we're delighted to welcome her back. Um, her most recent book, um, Ireland's Gramophones, Material Culture, Memory and Trauma in Irish Modernism, should be on everyone's Christmas book list this year, and um, was published this autumn by Clemson University Press. Um, and she's also published widely on Elizabeth Bowen, uh, George Bernard Shaw, Lennox Robinson, Elizabeth Gaskell and Jane Austen. Um, and her other current research projects are situated at the intersections, as she's an interdisciplinary scholar, uh, between material culture, gender studies and word and music studies. So we're delighted to have Zan with us today. I'm equally delighted on the other side um, of, of, uh, of the Atlantic and of the Irish Sea indeed is uh, Dr. Adrian Patterson. Um, Adrian is a lecturer in English at uh, the University in Galway. He's published widely in 19th and 20th century literature from birds to broadcasts and pianos to poems with a particular interest in artistic interactions of modernism and Irish literature. He's written on very well-known authors such as Shaw, Joyce, Elliot and Pound, and also has incorporated lesser known um, writers and musicians uh, and artists such as Florence Farr and, and Harry Parch uh, into his work as well. He's also been a curator of the multimedia uh, exhibition that was uh, widely celebrated, Yeats in the West, and is co-editor of the forthcoming Edinburgh Companion to WB Yeats and Arts, and has two special issues on modernism. Uh, published as well in recent years. He's also currently president of the Modernist Studies Ireland um, Association and is the director of the Yates Thor Valley Lee Society as well. So we're delighted to have Adrian as the, the guest respondent with us today. So without any further ado, um, I'll open the Zoom floor to Zan um, and we'll have the presentation for about usually the same as usual, about 30 minutes. We'll then move to Adrian's um, observations and comments and then we'll open it to the floor uh, for questions and answers afterwards. Um, and again, just as a reminder, um, at the bottom of your screens, uh, for those of you that are, are zooming in, you'll be able to see at the bottom there's the Q&A button and uh, that if you can direct your questions uh, for either Zan or Adrian to the Q&A button throughout, we'll get to those um, at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Nessa, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I will get my screen share going and then we'll get started. Okay. So I'm, I'm so excited to share with you my project, Seeing Wild Songs, um, and, and we'll, dive, we'll dive right in with this. Um, on, on January 16, 1916, Griffiths wrote out a final fair copy of what he referred to as his four wild songs. This is the first reference in his diaries that we have of his intention to combine the songs Le Jardin, Impression du Matin, La Mer, and Le Ravillon into a single collection. These four art songs were arrangements of Oscar Wilde's poetry of the same titles. Ten days later, on, on January 26th, 
Griffiths performed the works, which were to become four impressions, for his publishers at Shermer's. He writes of the encounter that they were enthusiastic about them and that one of the publishers knew the house would publish them. Unfortunately, two months later, Griffiths learned that Shermer would decline to publish the works and they remained unpublished during Griffiths' lifetime. The songs that make up Four Impressions were not composed together as a cycle, and yet together they create a masterful evolution of imagery and musical tonality that belies their disparate composition. We're going to talk a little bit about that composition process right here in terms of the timeline here. So in broad strokes, oops, excuse me. In broad strokes, we know that Oscar Wilde actually published his first two poems um, with uh, Impression du Matin and Le, Impression Le Ravillon in 1888 in his collection Poems. But those were not, po they, they weren't published collective by each other. Um, they're, they're, they're not next to each other in the collection. He then in 1882 published Le Jardin and La Mer in Our Continent, a magazine. Similarly, Griffiths didn't write these together. So in 1912, he wrote La Mer. In 1914, he composed Le Rabillon. In 1915, he composed Le Jardin and Impression du Matin again in separate places before he combined them as four impressions. So it's clear that there's no set kind of scheme in Wilde. He didn't plan for these pieces to be together and Griffiths didn't initially mean for these pieces to be composed together either. Um, so there's something else that's binding them together. So it's important to know that in the poems that Griffiths has chosen, Wilde actually uses significant use of go yellow gold imagery. And for Griffiths, he was a synesthete and, his color, and this color, yellow gold, was directly associated with the musical tonality of E flat. So as a result, the musical references and lyrical quality of Wilde's poetry combined with the color reference um, that Griffiths could physically hear while he was reading. And that seems to be um, an irresistible combination for Griffiths. He went on to um, compose a couple other um, Griffiths, a um, couple other Wilde songs as well. Um, I do think it's imp important to point out that it's an oversimplification to say that lyrical quality and yellow tonality are the only things that are binding together these songs. Um, I argue that these are actually a part of a cycle rather than a collection um, because Griffiths accomplishes a rather impressive tonal cohesion in these disparate works and teases out a narrative line about female sexuality that lies dormant in Wilde's poetry until combined in this very unique configuration and animated by Griffiths music. This is the kind of intermediality that a larger digital project for these two artists can reveal and which I'm currently working towards, though the project is in its nascent days. And this is just a small portion of the larger work that I'm hoping to do. But let's take our time now to move into four impressions um, specifically. Griffiths weaves E flat tones throughout the four pieces to draw out the same colors that were present in Wilde's works. The poems shift from a blasted garden in Le Jardin where the lily's withered chalice falls around a rod of dusty gold to the yellow pervasive fog in Impression du Matin, then the tawny clouds and yellow foam on the storm-dashed sea in La Mer, finally emerging as the yellow light that streaks gold across the warming sky in the Ravillon. Griffiths' use of tonal color weaves a simultaneously visual and aural tapestry that allows us glimpses into what might have been for what it might have been like for the composer to literally see his wild songs as a synesthete. This presentation will examine each song individually um, to draw additional attention to the musical interpretations and intermediality that Griffiths has posed in his pieces. So we will start with Le Jardin. This piece, um, we're going to, the, the, the structure I'm going to follow is that I will read, we'll, we'll kind of look at the poem briefly before painting the text and looking at Griffith's composition. So Le Jardin is actually depicting an untended garden with the wind blowing about fallen petals and dead leaves. And the first stanza begins with a lily, the traditional symbol of virtue and purity as the petals wither and fall, leaving only the rod of dusty gold. That remaining phallic stamen of the flower belies the symbolic virginal implication of the lily. And beyond the garden, on the wold, the last wood pigeon coos and calls, suggesting that the bird, often associated with love, has left the garden in its fallen state and chooses instead to perch in the beech trees, which are symbolic of the mythological and virginal Diana. So now let's look at how Griffiths treats this with his music. 
Griffiths begins in E flat minor, so his yellow gold tone, and it throws this kind of yellow minor key over the entire piece. Um, and so he he wanders up until the first vocal note that we get is that E flat falling, and it and then it just falls and withers throughout the rest of the piece. We get this fall from the lily all the way down to the rod of dusty gold, which we've already kind of mentioned. We then also get the wood pigeon's flight and Griffiths even gives us the call, um, the wood pigeon's call here. And I'll see if I can give you a snippet of that. And you can hear that call, it just sits there and waits. Um, and we have the idea that the speaker or the singer is straining to hear if their lost love is, is going to respond, um, but the pause yields nothing. So the poet and the singer move on and we get that gaudy leonine sunflower. Um, the sunflower a symbol of constancy, but this sunflower lies black and barren on its stalk um, with the intruding autumn. We then also notice in the piece that we're getting poco raffatando and we're getting constant crescendo. So we're getting this feel of the, the wind kind of sweeping through the garden, um, whirling erratic windswept dead leaves. And it just continues to kind of build and swirl. So we get this climactic um, B flat. And this is the singer's kind of cry um, and, and keening essentially um, at the grief of, wis uh, of witnessing the passing time. Um, this, this loss and the fact that time isn't going to heal things for her. Um, then we get the dead leaves scattered hour by hour, the fact that passing time is a very mocking thing. Um, and then we get the pale privets, white as milk. Um, and notice that we have Griffith signaling rubato several times here. Rubato means stolen time. Um, and so it's the singer is trying to slow things down, but they have to still stick within that rigid passage of time. And it's very symbolic of that um, larger tendency for the speaker to want to slow things down, to stay in this garden with the, with, before things have fully decayed. Um, but you can steal time, but the, the piece still continues to move towards that interminable end. We're also getting the pale privets, um, the privet petals. These are white petals that are blowing through the piece. Um, signaling the coming of snow and winter. Um, and then we're left with this final image here of the roses lie upon the grass like little shreds of crimson silk. Um, it's a very violent imagery. Um, it feels like the petals suggest the passion or love that created the garden now lies torn and seemingly bleeding on the garden grass. There's also potentially a, a virginal reference here. Um, and Griffiths actually chooses to end this piece with the vocalist singing a B flat the dominant fifth of, yellow of the yellow gold key center of E flat minor, while the accompaniment doesn't resolve and, um, and provide that E flat bass, it's not a full chord. So there's a sense of irresolution that happens here in the piece. Um, it's really trying everything it can to resist kind of a conclusion to the song. So let's listen to a little bit of that. And it just hangs there. So this, this poem and Griffith's music combine to make a very powerful narrative of an abandoned garden um, and the introduction of sexuality as well. And it evokes kind of the Garden of Eden motif. But by leaving the song unresolved, it really is asking us to move on to the next piece in, in the collection. And that's Impression du Matin. Um, the resolution asks us also to kind of consider the fallen woman again. If the garden that we've just listened to is a fallen woman, Impression du Matin takes that out of abstraction, puts a literal um, sex worker in front of the, of the, of the poem um, and makes us kind of confront it that way. So the description of a dawn breaking over London in Impression du Matin moves from broad swashes of color in the darkness to emerging shapes of buildings and street life, and finally to the lone figure of a prostitute. 
Wilde's first line, evoking the nocturne made famous by Friedrich Chopin. Chopin suggests the poem's inherent musicality. It's also a, a reference to Whistler. Um, and Griffiths seems to agree that there is this kind of musical ability here in the shifting colors. There's a moment here that he wants to capture. And so let's look at how he deals with this piece in, in, um, in the musical adaptation, musical setting. So Griffiths starts the accompaniment um, and he directs that it should be veiled entirely by two petals. So he's commanding that there's this blending of tone and color and music throughout the whole piece. There's this, this kind of mistiness, a, a quality that's, that's meant to be pervasive throughout the whole piece. Um, as we get the blue gold of the, of the early rising sun, um, we also see that Griffiths takes a couple of really interesting um, poetic liberties with the piece. Um, so in the wild poem, um, once we get um, a barge with ochre colored hay dropped from the wharf, the line continues with and chill and cold. But you can see here that Griffiths has taken advantage of the colon here. And he's created, instead of you know continuing onto one line, he's created an entire break here, creating that seishura, um, that break, in order to musically do something that's really important. Um, he is, in the next line, going to be describing a yellow fog that creeps down the bridges. And what he's doing here by creating that seishura um, and, and then combining this line directly into this phrase, he is creating a fog that is actually slinking through the piece. So let's see if we can hear that. And then it just kind of continues to slink and slip through the piece. Um, and uh, Wilde's fog is obscuring, you know, the fog that he's describing in his poem is obscuring the scene, much like Griffith's persistent peddling is veiling the music of these passages. So, so Griffith is doing some very interesting things with the yellow fog. Um, Wilde's poem then describes the clang of waking life. You can see that he describes St. Paul's and then he says, Suddenly the clung, cl arose the clang of waking life. Again, Griffiths is taking advantage of pauses to create, um, to animate the, the chimes. Let's listen to that. And then you can hear that it's starting to build. Things are waking up. It's becoming a very, very exciting shift to this idyllic London morning, splashes of color and sound um, with the country wagon and everybody waking up. And then we get a reference to a bird here. This, should, this bird sh should remind us of the wood pigeon. And it floats up to the trees and sings. And again, we get some really beautiful moment here where it actually, this, this song is lilting accompaniment that supports the melody and soars to the highest note of the song and it floats to what is essentially a faux finale. Um, but you can hear that this is kind of a, 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 the bird is flying above and we're getting this beautiful moment. So it feels like the conclusion, it feels like this glorious conclusion to this moment, but then we get a very, very different tone when we move into the last stanza of the piece. Um, the woman in this poem has been subject to a lot of discussion since many people view this as a condemnation of the sex worker on moral grounds. Griffiths is therefore in his piece going to kind of weigh in on this. And his music reflects a marked shift in tone. It becomes a much more so um, somber, moment and it's minor tones and we actually get this kind of plodding these quarter notes here that are just plodding and it sounds like the woman's footsteps as she emerges from the flame sorry from the from the fog um, we notice that there's also the sempre um sempre coni du, du pedale this this the pedal that's kind of 
again, pervasive until we get to this moment where we have the gas lamp flare with lips of flame um, in a passage that is really almost temporarily atonal. And then it comes back to this very soft um, heart of stone. And so it's suggesting the lips of flame is this really crisis moment. Um, and then with the heart of stone, the fact that it resumes so quietly and fades into this final measurement, it, it almost implies that the heart of stone doesn't belong to the, to the woman, but rather to those who feel like they are going to be able to make judgments in this very clouded yellow foggy scene. You know, there's, there's no place for that moral judgment. So let's see if we can hear where Griffiths is essentially resisting resolution. He's resisting that judgment here in this final moment with, with this lone woman. That last note just hangs there. It sounds like there could have been a resolution, but Griffiths re refuses to do so. And I feel like that is him refusing to judge uh, the figure that we have here. So with that last kind of ambiguous moment hanging there, um, Griffiths then blasts us into the opening charge of La Mer, which is the third song of impression uh, of, of four impressions. And, and it's the one that perhaps overtly has the least to do with obvious connections to female figure. But um, in fact, um, Sharon Smolders describes it as a hyper-masculine poem. Um, which, you know, fair. However, the French poem, um, the French term for the sea in the title as well, at, you know, as a feminine noun compounded by Western traditions of referring to the sea as gendered, um, as female, is essential to understanding the tension of the poem as the man-made ship fights the sea, the feminized sea for dominance in the scene. And the music is, this is, this is my favorite of the four impressions because the music so clearly adapts the scenes. Each stanza gets its own kind of story where we're focusing on the storm and then the boat and then the re remaining traces of the storm. Um, and the piece ends um, with a, a, a sea that's victorious um, without a trace of that ship. So um, let's see how, how Griffiths treats that in his piece. So it's important to kind of get a feel for the way that he just kind of charges molto tempesto so into the opening of this piece. And it just crashes down into this into this shift. So it's, you're getting this this tempestuous moment where the where the moment the the music is reflecting this tossing storm, while the singer is trying to um, just kind of stay on top of it. Um, and then we get the yellow fog again. We should be kind of seeing that with the misty shrouds and then the tawny clouds. Um, and then you can see here that there's a stanza shift, and then there's an entire key shift. Um, that Griffiths gives us. And then, so now instead of, you know, crashing waves, we get poco a poco, pui calmato and mysterious. And um, the fact that the speaker is, is sorry, the, the singer is supposed to speak mysteriously. Um, and we get this very real sense of interiority that the steersman, muffled steersman is trying to fight the sea um, in this very phallic boat. Um, let's kind of listen to that. And then it gets more frantic. So at that moment, we see that the um, accompany becomes accompaniment becomes more agitated and pronounced in the volume of the chords. So we're starting to see the melody heave and pitch as well. So the feminized C, which is represented by the accompaniment, the piano, and man represented by the singer, is strugg they're struggling for dominance. And we see that, you know, it's pretty clear who wins with those last three rolled chord chords, the presto furioso, feroce, um, the very emphatic silencing of the, of the, of the representation of, of man. 
love that part. That's one of my favorites. Um, and so in the final stanza, again, we have a new stanza. So in a different key tone, and we start this one, tranquillo. Um, and so we're seeing the remains of the storm here. And the last kind of image that we're left with is the thin threads of yellow foam floating on the waves like raveled silk, sorry, like raveled lace. And what we're getting here is this, um, the hint at the kind of the triumph that the sea has experienced here. There's no sign of the boat or the steersman. They've sunk beneath the waves. Um, we're now, now that we know that the, sea, the, the, the boat has, has failed, we're able to understand in the first stances all those references to, to the clouds and the shrouds and, and the kind of violence that's coming. Um, and this last image of the yellow lace, um, it's suggestive of feminine imagery that's overriding the masculine. The sea obliterates the male presence, perhaps proposing a parallel obliteration of society, socially imposed constraints on female sexuality. Um, it could also potentially be like corset lacings that are being released here. Um, but I want to potentially draw, particularly draw your attention to the way that this piece ends, floating on like raveled lace. And then we get the, the instructions here, vivace, retenuto. We get this idea that um, the sea is almost taunting us with the seemingly playful treatment of male destruction in, in the vivace. Um, and the sea is mysterious, destructive, beautiful, tantalizing. Um, and the final lively moments of the song hint at, at a potential rebirth. So let's listen to that last little um, ta taunting of the sea. And notice that it ends on that clear note and it's a clear positive note. Um, so we're, we're, we're asked to then move into this, this next piece, which is Le Ravillon, it's a kind of rebirth. So as the capstone of four impressions, Le Ravillon ties together images and colors from the previous works. For instance, in French, Le Ravillon means sunrise or dawn, but it also has a painter, um, a, an artistic reference, um, which means to a strong lighting effect against a somber background. And that's exactly what Griffiths is doing with his piece. And, and um, by putting these four together, he's putting these kind of darker scenes. And then we have the Le, Le Ravillon, which is, which is that strong, bright contrast against those darker, somber backgrounds. So Le Ravillon plays with both definitions, you know, of dawn and, and um, that painterly effect. Um, and this piece, we witness the dissipation of the mists and shadows of each work that came before as they flee from the sunrise. We remember the wold of, the, of Les Jardins, when the, the waves of sunlight wake into flight the bird that flitted through the two previous poems and a white lady emerges as a central simile of the poem, evoking the implied and explicit women that have come before. The sky is laced, again a reference to the previous poem, with color, recalling the yellow textures of the works and binding this tapestry of images um, into this really coalesced meaning. Um, so, so let's see how again he treats, Griffiths treats this in, in his work. <clears throat> The accompaniment for La Mer plumbed the depths of the sea and Le Ravillon emerges um, from that nadir and rises over the first 10 measures <clears throat> to its highest pitches. So we're getting kind of a literal sunrise in that music and over those first 10 lines, it just rises triumphantly. It's really quite beautiful. Let's hear that first piece. So before we even get the voice, we, we know that this is a triumphant song. Um, Griffith's score then visually creates waves um, throughout the accompaniment, reminding us that this is birth that's happening through the new dawn and it's, and it's from the sea. The sea is giving birth to this, to this um, fresh morning. So you can see that there's um, these, these tied notes are creating visual waves throughout the page. There's, there's so many tied notes. It visually com communicates the sea. Um, and then we get the sea, um, 
that, that, that this dawn is rising from the sea. Again, it's evoking, um, I think it has a lot of resonances with Venus um, rising from the sea, particularly in um, Sandro Botticelli's um, Venus, the birth of Venus. So it's also important to notice that Griffiths has the white lady is what's rising from the bed. Um, because for Griffiths, we don't have his entire color scheme for color hearing, but we do know that C major for Griffiths was an incandescent white light, the most brilliant key in the tonality. So the fact that he's had all these yellow tonalities and now he has this white lady rising from her bed and, and yet that there's these gold tonalities, we're moving from gold, that kind of withered gold in the garden and now we're getting this bright light that's piercing through the fog and really creating this vibrant, victorious light. And he, Griffiths loved C major, um, which is the tone, the, the key of this piece as well. Um, we also notice that there's a lot more um, sensual imagery. So the jagged brazen arrows of light are interacting with the waves. Um, again, it's the yellow light that's breaking across this dawn. Um, and one of the things that I think is most interesting about this piece, um, as, as the dawn spreads across this piece, across the wold and the flight of the bird, again, we're supposed to be thinking of the Chardin, um, but then we have all the chestnut tops are stirred and the um, branches flushed with gold. And that's the final line that we get. I want to particularly point out here that Griffiths is doing something really interesting. He substitutes here the word flushed. Um, the word substitution is his own introduction to the poem because in, in Wilde's piece, it's actually streaked with gold. Now Griffiths probably does this for two reasons. First of all, um, for practical reasons, it's very hard to, if because the way that that note is supposed to be sung, this is the highest song of the entire piece. It is of, of the whole collection of four impressions. Um, it is also the, it's very hard to sing, you know, a triumphant note like that was streaked because you have two hard consonants in it that you were not able to sing. Whereas you can sing through the F and the sh. So flushed, you can still sing that, um, but flushed also has very sexual connotations in terms of the blush of young women. It's sung at fortissimo, it's stinged over two measures, it's the highest vocal note of the song, um, and it's the flush of gold from dawn signaling a sexual awakening and renewal. It's a stunning moment. Um, and it's flushed with gold, that gold triumph that takes us into the final piece. Those final measures of the accompaniment echo the opening passages of Le Ravillon ascending from the depths of the bass cleft, cleft to the accompaniment's highest tones for the piece, fi piece's final, final emphatic chord. It is a song that ends in female victory. Love that, that conclusion. So Griffith's Four Impressions leads us through a series of wild poems that create an intermedial narrative, moving from fallen to triumphant depictions of female sexuality, this narrative only emerges, however, through an examination of Wilde's works via Griffith's compositions. Griffith's works lend new interpretive light for Wilde's works, uh, becoming a cohesive narrative in Griffith's hands. Four Impressions also clearly demonstrates Griffith's finely tuned attention to poetic detail and the tapestry of music, color, words, and images that ultimately combine this work as an intermedial triumph deserve further explication which I am, I'm work, looking, excited, looking forward to doing with the rest of my project. So thank you. That's wonderful, Sam. Thank you so much. And uh, it's, it's wonderful to have that kind of color and autumnal presence, I think, with us here anyway on the west of Ireland uh, this evening. So it's, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, I will hand it over uh, to Adrian for the moment, and then we'll take some questions um, from any of the attendees. Do again, feel free to add any questions or comments into the Q&A button at the end of your, of your screens. So Adrian, over to you. Thank you so much, um, Nessa, and thank you, Zan, um, for a really wonderful paper. I'm just trying to share a screen. Let me know if it doesn't work in a second or two. Um, uh, let's see now. 
Um, yeah, but I hope you can. Can you see that? All right, is that is that working? Yes, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'll see if I can get. Into, oh gosh, hang on. So I'll see if I can get it to a presentation view. Hang on right now. Oh dear. Um, anyway, the, the, I'll. I think I'll begin talking properly. Um, thank you so much, Dan. It was really rich paper. I mean, my job is to respond, not so much to ask questions, but I, I have lots of questions, as you might imagine. It's such a rich topic and such a rich paper. Uh, rich in every sense, with rich in, in colour and, and music and synesthesia. Um, so I'm going to try and sketch in some context for people um, under three headings. One, one is the cent central... Um, if you like project that you're working on, but also is, is a kind of massive um, uh, obsession of the period that you're working on, the intermediality, um, as we might call it now, um, or synesthesia, as they tended to call it then, this, um, um, this wonderful um, uh, confusion of the senses. Um, the, the second is, is to try and sketch in a, a sense of a kind of transnationalism that, that this, this is, I mean, this is an Irish studies seminar after all, and Ireland does come into it, but there's also so many other nations that kind of seem to play a part in creating these, um, well, both the poems and then also the, the songs, um, which seems interesting. And thirdly, a, a sense in which there's a kind of developing modernity, even a, a modernism in this. Um, and maybe my central question to you in a sense would, would be that, you know, about the modernism of these songs, because they're some, somehow in their own way really interesting and strange and kind of wonderful. And they're, you know, obviously, work from Wilde's poems, but those poems are 40 years earlier. So there's something really interesting about what they're trying to do. Anyway, um, to do that, partly I thought I'd use these images. I mean, one of the reasons I'm doing that is because synesthesia, is, as Dan knows very well, is, is this kind of sickness, if you like, it's kind of disease. I mean, it is for some few people a very literal disease, but it becomes more a kind of malady du jour or a malady of the fin de siècle. Particularly, I'm saying it in French because it's associated with French poetry, particularly Baudelaire and Rimbaud. Um, and well, later Rambo and Malame and others. Um, and it's this wonderful sense in which the senses can be, uh, if you like, deliberately mixed by artists to do something very interesting. Um, that gives rise to the sense that there's a Frenchness to this, which of course is true from the titles of those poems. There's very much a kind of French sense, impression du matin, la mer, le réveillon. So Wilde himself is embarking in some kind of francophone um, journey in these poems, and he has others, uh, you know, others called nocturnes and others called called very kind of obviously French titles, quite close in his over, which I think is kind of interesting. Of course, they're not just uh, French; they're they're also in some way very local things. So I, the slide, the first slide I've got here is a, is a is a kind of rather dull grey or brown and uh, um, silver Whistler later calls it of of Old Battersea Bridge, which is his, if you like, more kind of representative, not quite realist, but representative kind of work. Whistler is, of course, known very much to Wilde, and Wilde is playing off Whistler in these poems kind of deliberately, I think, in lots of obvious ways. Um, I've chosen this because it, it looks representative. There's people in the front. There's maybe even a narrative that might even be the artist in the bottom left-hand corner. But very quickly, this sort of work becomes very different. It looks like a bit more like this, which is, again, of Battersea Bridge, but you can see how different it is. It's um, it's called itself, it's called a nocturne blue and gold on Battersea Bridge, um, which becomes a very different kind of proposition. I mean, that's in a sense what Wilde is almost kind of quoting in his poem. He, the poem Impression du Matin that, that is later set to music starts, the Thames nocturne of blue and gold changed to a harmony in grey. That, that's the first couple of lines. So in a way, he's kind of weirdly citing this picture which by the time he writes the poem is of course, you know, really famous. It's involved, Whistler's involved in a kind of court case um, with John Ruskin, um, in which, you know, he, Ruskin basically accused Whistler of throwing a pot of paint in the public's face very famously and Whistler sued him and kind of won but lost. Um, and this picture was brought up in court. Is, is this as a joke or is this some kind of, you know, humoristic thing? Are, are you taking the piss? And he said, no, this is very serious. And I'm using the term nocturne because he says, by using the word nocturne, of course, as Zan says, it's a Chopin piece of music that, that said at the night, um, and it also very French necessarily then. I'm using the word nocturne because I wish to indicate an artistic interest alone, divesting the picture of any outside anecdotal interest which might otherwise have attached to it. A nocturne is an arrangement of line, form, and color first. So in this sense of, of we've got a nocturne here, we've got something that's actually 
kind of in some way outside of narrative it's an arrangement is what he says so he's kind of trying to make us look at color and form and line and particularly i think color and form here in a, in a picture like this this is what he's so there's a kind of exclusion of narrative um and, and anecdotal interest which i think is interesting of course it's it's also transnational because it's also japanese it's very much influenced by japanese printing as Zan knows, as indeed all this kind of Japanese, maybe it's clearer in some of these other ones. This is the very first nocturne that Whistler does, which is actually, I mean, Wilde knows these because they're actually pictures almost of his home. Wilde lives somewhere over in that bank. This is um, this is from the Battersea side of the Thames and living at Chelsea. They're very oddly local to London, these pictures, in a certain weird way. Wilde lives about in the middle of that picture um, for a time later on. And what's interesting about this seems to me, I mean, I know, I know it seems to be kind of in a way off the topic, but it does bring together this idea of the possibility that, that you can see something um, in a poem or see something even in music that is very interesting. And so the arrangements of colors and forms seem to matter. And I think you talked about the painterly effect of the songs at one point. Um, and the idea that you might be able to see colors and forms, I think is, is kind of clearly influenced by the possibility that you can literally see them in certain ways. Uh, even, although, as you noticed, I think, or you noted that Wilde couldn't help but have narrative. So he still has a woman in that. So, so, so Whistler's picture, of course, is very much, you can even see the kind of Japanese influence, his little butterfly symbol at the bottom there is a kind of Japanese-ness to this, Japanese-ness to this. But also he did depict a woman. I, I'm always wondering if Wilde is kind of <laughs> putting a woman like this in the scene, you know. And Griff, Griffin is, is Griffiths is somehow borrowing from this because Wilde does have these kind of can't help but assume that this does have an anecdotal interest. And that's interesting and musically, I think, because it, you talked about the narrative of these songs, the kind of intermediate narrative. And I wonder if there's something interesting about music that works in time after all that still has to tell a narrative. Because um, finally, you get, well, a, a, a narrative disappears, I suppose, from, from pictures like this. Um, according to Whistler anyway. He doesn't call it like <laughs> the sad evening or <laughs> the long journey or those kind of <laughs> Victorian type titles. He's very definitely calling them. I mean, he goes back and calls his earlier pictures, nocturnes and things like that when they really were more, um, uh, uh, you know, there were other things. The other, uh, well, two other things I want to say. One is about countries and one is about modernity, right? So uh, there's a sense, McNeil Whistler is American. Um, Griffiths is also American. There's a sense in which it's possible for a kind of American, I'm, I'm, or at least I'm wondering if it's possible for a kind of American culture to be this, um, particularly at the time, to kind of to to choose and borrow and draw on what is French culture, English culture, in a sense, because this is a London picture and those poems, in some ways, in Wilde's poems, are London poems, um, and also J Japanese culture. Um, and whether it's possible to kind of draw on that, um, if you like, pick and mix approach to culture by, by doing this, it's, if, or, or transnational, depending on how you look at it. I say that partly because people like Ezra Pound are clearly doing this in the same way. And so this is where transnationalism um, in, in Johan Rosani's kind of terms comes to meet modernism, I guess, right? That, so that Ezra Pound <laughs> borrows in these poems, Japanese haikus, French, it's a metro station. One of these is famously in the station of metro is a metro station. Again, he's borrowing also kind of very much Wilde's idea about petals and um, pale wet leaves, those privets, um, um, petals and things like that. But what he's trying to do eventually, Pound is trying to do, and it's very much influenced by all this artwork that you've talked about and is more contemporary with Griffiths, which I think is interesting, like they're almost contemporary and when they're doing these things. Pound is trying to do something that actually leaves out narrative. You know, is actually, we can't quite manage it in Alba and fan piece for Imperial Law. There's kind of a sense that there's a woman in both of them. And in one, she lay beside me in the dawn. In the other one, you also laid aside, there's a sense. But eventually he's trying to kind of strip out narrative and even a spectator. So by Tai Chi or in a station of the Metro, there's actually a sense in which it's just an image. But of course, that's very much, again, influenced by um, painting. Um, so that's that's why I'm, I'm getting to. I'm interested in the possibility that this kind of modernism um, that, that can Griffiths share this in certain ways. I know because we're interested in Irish culture that there's maybe something interesting about that too. Because where does this where does this borrow from Irish culture? In fact, Wilde and Joyce and Yeats are all interested in this. So when Ezra Pound does a poem called Au Jardin, which is kind of borrowing from Wilde's title, 
he's quoting Yeats, for instance. So there's very much a sense in which you know Yeats is in some way the Irish representative of all this, um, this kind of borrowing. But I think more interestingly, maybe um, as a final thought, Pound manages to kind of eliminate things um, to make it kind of modern. Um, Griffith is doing something different because I think you're right that there's narrative in these songs, but it's, there's a kind of shifting of tonal centers, isn't there? There's, there's this interest in which, you know, he doesn't respect the verse forms at all. They're kind of through composed songs. They end in different keys in which they begin. The tonal center is kind of uncertain. There's no secure tonal center in a lot of these things. So that seems to be a really interesting way in which he's trying to do something different. He can't eliminate narrative because music works in time, but he's doing something really decentering of certainty or security or something by doing that and that seems to be really an interesting way in which he's doing it I, I don't know how much he's conscious of borrowing from pound or or whistle or anyone else I, I don't really know enough about him but he seems to me to be doing something really interesting interestingly modern and interestingly different um from from what in other words. so i suppose my last thought would be about the contrast really about what he's doing that's so obviously strange and different so there you are um synesthesia transnationalism with a bit of island not much Modernity, even modernism. That, that seems straight. Take, I took those things from your wonderful paper, which is, um, I hope we can talk about now. Brilliant. Uh, thanks a million, Adrian. And uh, I know that there's a, a I think another, uh, a, there was another Adrian in the audience as well from the music department. And of course, we have to say that John Field, the Irish composer, is uh, deeply associated with the uh, the Nocturne as well. So we'll we'll put another Irish connection in there to that uh, form in, in many ways. Uh, Zan, would you like to respond to any of the observations that Adrian had? I think it was a really rich set of observations. And thank you, Adrian, as well, for, for actually showing us the, the images as well. I think it makes it really rich and, and it, it opens up other ways of thinking about it as well across the painterly kind of dimensions via the, um, the, the verbal and the musical as well. So Zan, any? Any responses there? Yes, um, all of the, all of that was just very wonderful. Thank you, Adrian. That was that was just wonderfully put. Um, I think I think the references and the visual components of, of what Whistler is doing is so important to the intermediality of Wilde as well as Griffiths. I think I think there's no way that Griffiths could have been composing his pieces without knowing about the Whistler connection because it's it's just hitting you in the face, especially with. Um, Impression du matin. Um, I think that um, a couple of the things that I think are, are particularly interesting um, about the intermediality here is that um, in the larger project that I'm, that I'm working on, I do want very much to kind of include these kind of visual cues that you're talking about, Adrian, with, with Whistler, because um, I would like to have the, the score itself be just in, annotated so that you can click on you know, nocturne and then see like, here's what nocturne means. Here's, here's other connections. Here's where we're seeing it in the paintings and things like that. So, so that it's, it's very much so that the intermediality is central to the project, right? That, you know, this is, um, you know, how do, how do you help someone who isn't an actual neurological synesthete experience hmm. synesthesia? And, and, and this is kind of this, this intermediality is perhaps the best way that we have to approach it. Um, and so what I was doing is obviously just the smallest part of just drawing out those golds in the piece, but it, it deserves that, that visual treatment, Adrian, that you so beautifully um, provided for us today. Um, I think also it's very interesting to talk about um, Griffiths in terms of his own, um, his own trajectory. So his influence from Wilde and everything is, is actually, um, Wilde is someone he takes very personally. Um, I didn't have time to kind of dive into this part of the project today, but um, Griffiths was a queer artist and he, um, he, he found Griffiths, sorry, he found Wilde's biographies um, to be a, poor, a place of genuine reflection for him. He really was drawn to that we have in his journals that he's actually trying to work through his own queerness by looking at Wilde's biography and trying to find parallels. Um, so, so once he kind of is exposed to, to Wilde for the first time and around um, 1911 is around the first time that he's really kind of engaged, um, he, he really dives in. So he buys the collected works of Oscar Wilde. He buys, he, he reads at least two Wilde biographies. Um, and again, this is 1910, 1911. So we're talking about um, queerness um, being heavily coded in a lot of these circles. Um, so for him to kind of latch onto Wilde as not only obviously artistic inspiration, but as a personal kind of parallel um, 
it's again, very important to see how, how Griffiths kind of attaches importance to, to Wilde's biography um, in order to understand these kind of larger pieces. So things like the fact that he was living in London in certain places, or the fact that he, you know, had, had these, um, allusions to to um to Japan as you mentioned Whistler has it but but Wilde is fascinated by by um by Asian culture as well um it's interesting to note um because you brought up the Japizma um Griffiths has what 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 we kind of con construct as like three main phases as an artist his first phase was his Germanic phase because he actually went and studied in Germany and so it's very continental he's getting a lot of these these influences there um, around 1910, he actually comes back to the States, um, and this is considered his impressionistic period. Um, so that's from about, around 1911 to 1916, um, and that's the time where he's doing all of his Oscar Wilde poetry and um, and art songs. Um, so it's it's his most impressionistic period, um, and it's very invested in the Wild art song. Um, so Wild's version of Impressionism and then these other continental influences are definitely coming to the foreground. Um, Griffith's last phase, phase as an artist was actually um, a Japanese um, influence as well. So there's a there's a, a very interesting trajectory, even though he's kind of, you know, like you said, very nearly 40 years after, you know, 30 to 40 years after, after Wild, um, he is still following that trajectory in a very specific way. Um, he's, he's the first American impressionist composer. Um, and the fact that Wild is having such a foundational impact on his version of impressionism. I think that Adrian also, um, is, is an explanation of why we're seeing Whistler so very obviously that's why we're seeing the synesthesia, um, occurring. I do also really love your connection to to pound um that idea of of just just imagism just just give me the image um one of the things that i'm trying to personally reconcile with griffith's works is that he's calling them impressions and historically these have been considered again i, I mentioned this briefly this is a set of songs that's been considered kind of just a collection of songs like like these are ones that oh, I'm thinking of doing an art song in this key. And so you, you, you pick out La Mer and that's just the piece that you play. You don't play these as a song cycle, generally speaking. Um, and so I'm taking a risk by saying that this is a song cycle because impressionism usually doesn't allow narrative, especially with, with things like, like Pound um, and that, that being very parallel moments. Um, so it's a very interesting thing to try and say, oh, this is a song cycle. I, th I think that it is a song cycle. But to choose to create a narrative out of impressionism when Griffiths is also very, very interested in, you know, breaking down those narratives, um, it's kind of interesting. He, he's very famous for his, his um, poems for flute, for example, is a phase that he goes through. So he's, again, he's very into the, the synesthesia. Um, and when he doesn't, he's, Griffiths is primarily a, a pianist. Um, but when he does the art songs, he tends to take that synesthesia to the next level. So, so there's a lot of fun, densely packed things happening there. Great, that sounds great. I was wondering actually for both of you, I mean, in a way, could you just read Griffiths as just another interpreter of Wilde in a way mm -hmm. and read, read Wilde back via the lens of Griffiths in a way and maybe re-queer him in a particular mm -hmm. way and see the female figure in a different context. And I really like that idea. I, I really liked your interpretation of the sejura as well um zan in terms of obviously like the fog and the kind of the slowness and this heaviness that's kind of mm -hmm. there but also this pausing of this is it a figure is it not a figure this unknownness and this i think embracing that quality i think you brought that mm -hmm. out really well and obviously his rejection of any final resolution at the end and that speaks to what adrian was talking to about you know the key shifts and the and the, and the changes throughout starting off in one and then finishing in something completely different mm -hmm. um is, is there a wider thing to be made there about about wild or am I just getting wildly excited about all of this? <laughs> well, well, I will say I will say that I think it's very interesting to look at. Um, again, we know that wild was actually a, a, a large proponent for for women's rights, you know, with his work at um, the Women's Journal. Um, and so so he was rather progressive in his ideas for, for women, which is, you know, I think is often um, overlooked by the queerness. Um, but I think that his, his sensitivity to gender roles and gender identity is kind of an important thing. Um, and, and with Griffiths, um, he doesn't talk too much about politics, but we do know for sure that he voted for um, suffrage 
in the United States. So again, we have a very clear proponent for, for forwarding women's rights. Um, and so I think, again, something could be said about, yeah, you could, I think you could kind of, you know, re regender or requeer Oscar Wilde through Griffiths. Um, Griffiths is definitely doing that, right? He's imposing his own lens upon, mm -hmm. upon Wilde, but that they are both also, um, you know, the, the gender spectrum is becoming something that they are much more sensitive to um, mm. as artists, as as queer artists, you know, that there's there's a really beautiful kind of um, expansion of the spectrum from these from these two these two men, I think. Yeah. Um, just we had a question in from the, the comments as well from one of our attendees from France and um, from Marie. Um, she's congratulating you on a very impressive talk and uh, she was wondering if there was any connection between Griffiths and the French composers Debussy and Ravel and obviously having composed the symphonic poem La Mer. Um, so just wondering mm -hmm. if there was any connection you'd come across and the heads are nodding so I'm assuming that's an affirmative yes. Uh, but you might yes. want to just maybe speak to that a little bit, Zan, and we'll probably take maybe one more question and finish up shortly then. Okay. Um, yes, why, um, as, as I mentioned, Griffiths was on the continent right before he came back and started his kind of wild face. <laughs> wild face. <laughs> wild is so good for the puns. Like, can we just all appreciate that that just needs to be there? Um, but so, so there are definitely moments in his pieces where you can, you could almost hear the beauty. Um, you can almost hear Ravel. There's there's some really beautiful moments of um, of imitation that he's kind of transposing into his tonal qualities with those yellow golds. So mm -hmm. Griffiths is definitely aware of those of those composers, and he's definitely playing on those, um, but in in ways that it's 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 very similar to the way that Wilde is nodding at Whistler, right? There's mm -hmm. there's this kind of artistic like I see you, mm -hmm. I'm I'm riffing on something else. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, Adrian, would you want to comment on that as well or anything? Uh, no, it's, I, I was wondering, of course, about Debussy and other things as well, but um, no, I, I, I agree. It's, I mean, you can't you can't write a piece of music called La Mer without thinking of Debussy. Um, yeah. yeah. There's, but it, but it, again, it, interesting, the, it, it has a kind of, to use the French titles is in itself kind of interesting, itself kind of a marker. And, and, and I think Zan is right, it's, all this is potentially political. We forget the kind of political impact of something like impressionism which says we should look at the modern world or even whistler's pictures which says we should look at actually what's happening in the real world we mm -hmm. should as as poems these things might seem to be kind of aesthetic and therefore kind of removed from reality uh, but very often they're, they're about people smoking or kind of an underclass of of um uh, you know sex workers and these kind of things suddenly being included in poems very very kind of carefully in a if you like a kind of Japanese mold to make them seem almost like um, courtesans or indeed kind of empresses in Japan. So there's a very, there's a, as well as the kind of sexual and gender bending element to this, I think there's a really interesting kind of class kind of movement of political thing happening there as well, which is which is true. And so and so when when you set aside something, you take it into a, a picture or a, or a piece of music. We tend to forget that there's a political charge to that too, but I think mm. that necessarily is and probably. I, I wouldn't like to speculate too much, but Griffiths is, is his strange tonalities are probably also in some way, you know, they're strange, if you like, they're queer, they're deliberately so. And certainly for an American audience, I think of that period, you know, to, to write these songs in 1915 or thereabouts is, is really just something very, an American audience is not exposed to, even if you get Debussy, because it's Debussy really gone wrong. I mean, Debussy would, would not recognize some of that as being Debussy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very, very shifting. Debussy might do some of the same things, but would finally end with major chords and things in a way that this is not doing. So it's 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 trying to take a new, a kind of like American advance from that. I think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. do, do you get a sense though, in a way, I think with, with both as well, that, uh, but particularly with Griffiths, that, that there's a real sense of playing with things, you know, that playing with line, color, form. So it's quite, in a way, formalist in some ways, but yet as Adrian, as you were saying, they're smuggling in as well at the same time these socio-cultural issues in mm -hmm. underneath. So what looks like a formula for a title, so nocturne, you know, study in grey and blue, um, actually is an observation on an underclass, you know, on the wrong side of the Thames mm -hmm. in some ways, you know. Yeah. Mm. I, I would say just just the first part of your, your, your comment, Nessa, we were talking about the, um, the, the playfulness of what's going on here. Um, Griffiths, like like I mentioned briefly, um, he did actually do several other wild poems. He he did about three more, um, and he had one um, Wild's um, another impressionist poem, um, Le, Les Ballons, 
um, that, that is just full of vibrant color, just absolutely full of color. And for a synesthete like, like Griffiths, um, there's no yellow in that either. It's, it's like jades and yellow and, and vibrant reds. And, um, when he's trying to compose Les Ballons, he never, he never is satisfied with it in his lifetime. And it's because he's like, cause I think it's partially because he's playing with like, Ooh, can I put this color with this tone? Um, mm. and because it's flitting from one to the other so quickly, it's always a little bit I mean, and playing it now, it's, it has been published since he's, since he's passed, but it's so all over the place um, because I think he is playing with like, okay, what's my personal kind of tonal referent? Where's, where's my center? Um, because Adrian, you're, you're absolutely right. He's, he's doing some really funky things. Like people are like, whoa, what is this experiment? Um, and I think it's because it's, it's color hearing that he's the only one that can see the colors. Um, and so that's, creating these very new, unique, fantastic kind of tonalities. It reminds me of the Oliver Sacks book, you know, the man who mistook his wife for a hat, you know, so <laughs> it could be another, <laughs> an addendum onto that, another chapter onto that book in a particular way. Um, <laughs> we might, uh, I'm just conscious of the time here, but I want to say thank you both so much um, for such a really rich um opening session for the series uh, this year. Many thanks to Zan from, for, for zooming in from the United States and to Adrian zooming in from, well, Galway via Cambridge, I think, and also to Matthew Garrity, who's been assisting here with the, the Moore Institute as well in hosting uh, the, the webinars. And um, also thanks to Dan Carey and also to David Kelly at the Moore Institute as well for coordinating these on behalf of the Centre for Irish Studies as well. So uh, just to, before you all go, um, we, and we uh, have uh, a wonderful, another uh, wonderful speaker in our audience today, uh, Dr. Quilin Nivechon from uh, the University of Limerick, who will be giving our next seminar um, on the 25th of November, so another date for your diaries, so 4 p.m. on Thursday the 25th, um, and uh, Quilin will be talking about uh, the Carnival of the Ibsenites, the 1893 collaboration of Elizabeth Robbins and Alice Stopford Green, so we're in the same temporal kind of uh, setting, uh, but looking at a different kind of mode of performance um, on the stage and again a very transnational discussion of Ireland and Ibsen as well too so we look forward to, uh, to that in a month's time. I just want to say thank you all very much for attending today and uh, we will see you shortly uh, in about three or four weeks time at the next seminar so thank you all very much indeed thank you.